Greetings, dear participants. On behalf of the Center of the Center for Research and Training in Neurosurgery, we thank you for participating in the 2021 IWBNC Pre-Congress course. We hope this course will enhance your neurosurgical practice. Session one of this course was called Advanced Lateral Approaches to the Spine. We thank the Seattle Science Foundation, Dr. Rod Oskoyan and Dr. Luis Pimenta for providing an excellent cadaveric demonstration. Now we are proud to present session two of this course called Basics of the Sagittal Balance of the Spine. This session will comprise four academic lectures. Each topic will be discussed through a 30 minute academic lecture and a 15 minute question and answer session. We invite you to participate through our Q&A panel at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our staff will transmit your questions to our faculty. There will be an interactive section within the case discussion at the end of our course. For this purpose, enter to www.polf.com. Log in with your computer or mobile device and join the session with the presenter's username displayed on the presentation slide. Once you have joined, you can respond to the currently active question or survey. Please remember to enable cookies on your internet configuration. Our first lecture is named What is Sagittal Balance of the Spine and Why It is Important? Please feel free to write your questions in the Q&A panel at the inferior part of your Zoom screen. At the end of this lecture, we will have 15-minute Q&A session. Now, we would like to introduce Dr. Torres. He is a Colombian neurosurgeon from Samaritana University Hospital and Medi, Medi University Hospital, co-director of the Science Spine Surgery Laboratory and neurosurgery professor at the Rosario University Residency Program. Dr. Torres, we are honored for your participation. Thank you very much. All microphones are yours. Good morning, and thank you all for uh, our participants and assistants to join, for joining our course. The objective of this course is to enhance and review some of the basic principles required to understand and uh, initiate your evaluation of sagittal balance. So let's get started. Uh, today, we're going to start talking about what is sagittal balance of the spine and why it is important. So first of all, we have to review some of our biomechanical concepts. So what is balance? Well, balance is defined as a state in which different things occur in equal or proper amounts or have an equal or proper amount of importance. In other ways, or in other situations, the sum of all events is equal to zero, a state of equilibrium. And this is important because when it comes to forces, Newton's first law is gonna come into mind. It, what does Newton's first law say? It says that if the forces, forces that are acting upon an object are balanced, then the acceleration of that object will be zero. Therefore, there will be no movement. And that object will, in, will only start moving if there is an unbalanced force acting upon it. So this can give you an idea of what an economy of movement can be occurred. Once you have a state of balance, you don't need much force to start movement. But if a system is unbalanced, then you're gonna have to put in more force to initiate movement. So like in this case, when you have balance, as soon as you lose balance, movement is gonna occur. So now that we are talking about forces, well, what is a force? A force is a vectorial nature. We have to remember that. It's gonna have an origin, a magnitude, and a direction. And this, when applied to an object, is very important because in this case, when you see a, an object pulled by gravity, for that object to not move, you're gonna have to have a countervening force against gravity. And that force is gonna be acting constantly against gravity to maintain an equilibrium, therefore no movement. So to there, to there be a balance, you're gonna have to have the sum of the vectorial forces is gonna be equal to zero. And this, is that, this equilibrium or balance can be viewed in two different ways. It can be in a static position, like a snapshot of a certain uh, situation, like we see on the left, where you, there's a, a person holding an object and the static load of the object is counterbalanced by the forces uh, made by the musculature or a dynamic or move or equilibrium of movement, like on the right, where someone is going up the stairs, but the stairs are going down at the same time. And this is the, where we're going forward. Right now we're, we're concentrated on studying static equilibrium and trying to analyze things in a static position. But as we all know, well, the biomechanics of the human body are dynamic in nature. 
So this is where the future is going to take us to study movement and how this equilibrium and how the balance of forces interacts during movement. Another key concept is moment arm. A moment arm is when you apply forces to a fulcrum and that's gonna generate a rotational movement around that fulcrum. Therefore, it's gonna have a transforming force on a rotation. And why is this important? Because this is the main way in which our body transforms the muscular contractile force into actual movement on a joint. And the, in the same manner, the joints are gonna transform the loads generated by gravity or the loads generated by other kinds of movement into a lever mechanism on the joint where the muscle is gonna act to counteract that force. So this is gonna enable the body to do various things. First, as we said, I said previously, convert muscle contraction into movement. And second, it's gonna have a transforming factor on the forces acquired during this movement. So how does this work on the, on the vertebral column? Well, this force redirection and multiplication is gonna be directed depending on the center of balance or the center of rotation of the vertebral body. And the center of the rotation of the vertebral body is usually in the posterior third of the body. And the structures that are anchored to the spine are gonna exert forces around the vertebral body and make it move. And the more, the farther away that the force is applied from the center of gravity or the center of rotation of the vertebral body, then the more important is the amount of torque or move or rotational movement that can be applied. And this in that case uh, that you see on the right, for example, you can see how the different ligaments have different moment arms depending on their distance from the center of gravity or a center of rotation of the vertebral body. This is one of the reasons why the Longi the posterior longitudinal ligament is, is strong, but it's not as important as an interspinal ligament with respect to restricting flexion forces because the moment arm is much greater with respect, for example, to the posterior longitudinal ligament. So what is this about the center of mass or center of gravity? Well, the center of mass is where the mass of an object is concentrated. And in a regular object like this cube, it's gonna be in the center of the body. In an irregular object, it's gonna depend on the, how the mass is distributed around that body. So it's gonna depend on its density and it's gonna depend on its shape. So what happens when we apply forces to a body at the center of mass? If we do this, the mass is gonna move because we're not gonna generate no torque. The moment arm is zero because the arm at which the distance is gonna be zero. If we apply fo forces on an offset, there is gonna be an applied moment arm. So that's gonna generate rotation, a rotational force that's gonna be stronger the further away from the center of gravity that you are. And this center is the instantaneous axis of rotation. And as we saw previously, we're gonna have an axis of rotation in all of the six axes. So we're gonna have an axis of rotation for flex and extension, for lateral bending, and for rotation of the vertebral body. And one of the curious things about uh, the, the spine is that once you initiate a rotational movement, that instantaneous axis of rotation is gonna shift so ever so slightly. So in, especially in kyphotic or extension forces, once you generate, you initiate a rotational movement, the, mo the moment the instantaneous actions, uh, axis of rotation is gonna move away. Therefore, the, there's gonna be a larger moment arm and that same force is usually gonna have a stronger impact. And that's very important in kyphotic changes to the spine. Another important concept with respect to a post positional stability is the base of support. For an object to stay upright, the center of gravity is gonna have to stay over the center or the base of support, like in this example. If that does not happen, the further away you move from the base of support, then it's gonna become more and more unstable. Up to a point, like in example number three, where the, you need an external force to be applied to maintain the, uh, the object standing upright. So this is like the inclining tower of pizza. It's not falling, but it's inclined. It's, why hasn't it fallen? It hasn't fallen because the center of gravity is still right under the base of support. 
And this is the typical situation of an unstable system, but it is still within the limits that can be sustained and maintained upright. And why is this important to us? Well, the human body tends to be inherently unstable. And why is the reason of that? Because we, as a evolutionary species, we started as quadrupeds and we had a, a large base of support and our center of gravity was low, close to the ground. So it's, it's very stable. But as we started to walk and we started to get upright, the more we did, we transferred, we transferred to that state, then the, the center of gravity of the human body went up and the base of support got shorter. And that makes a very small base of support with a very long distance from the center of gravity to that base of support. Therefore, it's not very tolerable to move that base of center of, base, uh, center of gravity forward or backward because it can easily move away from the center of gravity, from the base of support, therefore becoming completely unstable. And this base of support is not in a static position, will change once you change your position. And since we have a large range of movement, it's going to be completely variable. So, yeah. so during sports, for example, like in this skating example, the center of gravity is going to move away from the center of space of support. And that's why, in this case, the athlete has to move his arm to support his belt in order not to fall. And this, con this concept takes to us all the way down to Dr. de Bousset, one of the first uh, established concepts about balance. And on base of the base of support, this is where the cone of efficiency comes, comes from. And he stated that within, if you maintain the body or the center of gravity within this cone, you're gonna still be stable enough to maintain an upright position. But as farther away you get from the center of the cone, the more energy you're gonna to have to input to the system to, be, to not fall over. And this is basically due to that relationship between the base of support and the center of gravity. So the next question is, how is this balance related to spinal degeneration? Well, a key concept is contact force. And the contact force is the compressive force that is acted upon the spine. And it's gonna be higher the lower you go into the spine because of the more body weight that's gonna be involved. And this contact force is gonna be derived from very dis for different sources. First, gravity. Second, the muscular forces acting upon the spine and the applied moment arms that are gonna be applied to, those, to the spine and the different spinous segments. And as we saw previously, if you, do, if you generate a situation where there's movement or flexion, there's be, there be flexion or kyphosis or extension or shear forces, you're gonna be moving the center of rotation. Therefore, you're gonna be changing the moment arm and changing the forces applied on each spinal segment. So how does this translate? Well, the contact force is gonna be the force, if you take it as a crane, you're gonna have on the back, you're gonna have the muscular forces, which are gonna be acting in contraction to avoid, to move that other lever, which is the weight or the load that's gonna be chaired on the spine. So this muscular force is gonna to have to counteract that weight. And this, does, and this is done by transforming the forces. But this force and this force are gonna be summed up on over the, the stand of the crane. And these forces are gonna chair here, and that's the contact force. So the contact force is gonna be a reflection of the load forces applied on the musculature, by the musculature, and the load forces applied by the load that you're sharing. One of the curious things about this is the following. It's gonna be dependent on a moment arm. So the further away, the load is directed from the spine, the larger impact on the spine that that load is gonna apply. Therefore, to compensate the muscular forces, if they're not balanced, well, you would do go with inflection and you generate like hyphosis. So to balance this, you have to have a, con a muscular contractile force that's gonna be equal to the weight. But since it's gonna be applied to a fulcrum, that distance is important. The distance at which you apply the load, the load may be variable, but the distance that the muscle has to apply toward the center of gravity of the spine is actually fixed. So to counteract the change, you're gonna to have to work uh, at the different force to compensate these loads. How do you see this? You can see this in this manner. 
If you change the distance from the load, then the moment arm is going to change, being much larger because of the larger distance. But on the back side, on the spine, on the muscular side, the muscle, the moment arm is going to have to grow as well to compensate. The distance is fixed, so then you're going to have to have a larger muscular contractile force to compensate the shift in the load point on the on the load that's, that you're sharing. Therefore, the contact force is now the sum of the original weight, the load that you're sharing, plus an enlarged muscular contraction force to compensate the shift in the position of the load bearing force on front or the kyphosing force. This is one of the main principles that, in a, that, that, change, that tells you why changes in spinal position can have very important changes in the biomechanics of the spine because it's going to change in a very important way how much force you're going to have to apply to compensate changes in position. And this is ever grows ever worse as far as you move the center of gravity forward. So the more kyphosed the spine is, the more force or counteracting force you're going to have to apply constantly to counteract this position. And one of the classic situations where you can see this is in obesity. As our population becomes so more obese, the center of gravity goes forward. Therefore, even though the weight may be relatively not much than before, that shift in the position of the center of gravity is going to have a very important kyphosing effect on the spine. Therefore, the muscular force or contractile force that's going to be applied is much larger. And at the same time, the contact force or the compressive force on the spinal segments is going to be much, much uh, higher, more enhanced than in other situations. So this contact force is, since it's a vertically applied force related to the translation of the, for, of the gravitational force on the spine, once it comes to each, con each spinal segment, it's going to be derived because the spinal segments change in their position with respect to the horizontal. So if the lower we are, it depends on the situation, this contact force is going to have a shear, of, a shear component and it's going to have a compression component. And these two, these two components of the compression force are going to have diff different effects on the spine. So in, if you have a relatively horizontal segment, like in this case, the predominant force is going to be actual compression. And this, and there's going to be a lot of compression, but little shear. And this will lead to disc overload, early loss of disc height, the appearance of small nodules, canal, central canals, canal stenosis due to disc hypertrophy, to disc and bulging, sorry, concentric disc herniations, and discogenic pain because of constant, constant disc overload. If you, if you go up on the spine where the spine is relatively uh, angulated to the back, you're going to have a hyperflexion moment. So you're going to have a posterior shear force and an anterior compression force. And this is going to create an, a, a, a different configuration on the disc compression, where the posterior part of the disc will bulge and the anterior part of the disc will become co compressed severely. This will lead to anterior disc overload, posterior bulging of the disc with, with narrowing of the foramen, and in extreme cases with the with the evolution of degenerative disc disease, you're going to actually develop spondylolisthesis. So this is one of the mechanisms that will lead to retrolisthesis in higher spinal segments. When you, if what happens if the for is if the angulation of the disc space is downward? Well, you're going to have tend to be hyperextended. Due to that, the forces applied are going to be posterior compression and an anterior shear force. So what happens here is you're gonna have uh, an overload of the facet joints, which will tend to hypertrophy. And this facet hypertrophy will encroach on the canal and the foramen, and it will eventually lead to facet joint stability, to overload of the pars interarticularis, stenosis due to a bulging of the yellow ligament, bulging of the disc, spinous process impingement with pain, and finally, when there's mechanical failure, you'll have anterolisthesis, which is the common mechanism in those uh, 
segments which are angulated downward, which is traditionally L4, L5, and L5S1. So all of these processes are worsened by the effects of disc degeneration. Disc degeneration leads to loss of disc flexibility. It leads to a, a reduced capability of the disc to support loads. And therefore, by losing the, the disc, the, the height, the facets are gonna be overloaded. That loss, lo, loose loss of flexibility will avoid the, the ability of the disc space to compensate movements. And it will also permit the disc to be in a state of hyperflexion or hyperextension with much less angular mo movement than if it was in a native or well uh, in a good state. So once it, 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 since it's not flexible, once you try to extend a segment or flex a segment, it'll easily, very easily reach its uh, limit, therefore overloading the spinal segment. And this will lead to inflammatory changes, which as uh, itself will lead to hypertrophy, spondylosis, ligament thickening, and stability, instability. So these effects will be seen depending on the type of spinal curvature. And where in the spine uh, we look at, these changes will actually be developing. So if you look at the higher parts of, of the spine, we'll tend to have uh, more axial compression and retral aesthesis, and lower about down in the spine, you'll tend to have more facet uh, hypertrophy, facet disease, and anti anterior aesthesis. And this is very important to take into account, as we'll see later in the how the spine degenerates during aging. So what is balance and what is alignment? These are two terms that are very close interconnected, but are not the same. As we saw, balance is a biomechanical state of equilibrium, which can be static or dynamic, and is which we are, what we're trying to go towards. But we try to make a snapshot of what happens with respect to force balance or force equilibrium. And this spinal balance will allow, to con allow us to contract the force of gravity, maintain the center of gravity over the base of support, therefore maintaining posture, maintain horizontal gauge, and make and maintain a state of the uh, most economical uh, state for uh, energy balance. Therefore, you don't need much energy to initiate movement. And with progressive imbalance, you're gonna have to start enabling compensatory mechanisms to not fall over. And this can lead to pain, fatigue, and deformity. So with respect, that's balance. So what is alignment? As we saw the position and the angular uh, disposition of these forces it actually have a big impact on how these forces act on the spine. Therefore, the position and the shape of the spine have a very important Im impact on balance and the forces applied in the spine. This makes it possible to, for us to measure the spine, measure the angles and the relationships between the spinal elements, and therefore have an inferred idea of what is happening with respect to the forces. So alignment is a geometrical and spatial relationship between the different parts of the human body, in this case, the spine, the spinal segments. And when these segments are properly aligned, we can assume that there is a state of balance. And this can be measured by angles, distances, relative positions that we are going to use and that we are going to learn about during this course to be able to have an, an idea of what are, is the state of balance of the spine through alignment, which we can measure on x-rays. So as this is an approximation of balance in a specific, in a specific state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Torres. Please stop sharing your screen. So once again, thank you for your lecture and the audience for your attention. Now we will continue with the Q&A section for this lecture. We remind you that you can write your questions in the Q&A panel at the bottom part of your Zoom screen. So Dr. Torres, the first question was written by Dr. Sanchez from Colombia. It says like this. Thank you, Dr. Torres. It was a wonderful lecture. In your experience, which would be the best approach in order to study spine biomechanics on presurgical planning? You have to have an, a, the most integrated approach possible. It all starts with clinical examination, uh, right? You have to see how the patient walks, the posture, 
during his standing position without support? Uh, how is the movement of the different joints, the, not only the spine, but the hip and the knee joints? We'll see a, a, a few things about that later. Once you have a good idea of how that dynamic component is working, you can see that clinically, then you should obtain a full spine x-ray, uh, the most complete uh, x-ray possible. And you start analyzing the components or the alignment components of balance, therefore trying to gain an idea of what is the current situation of the patient, what their normal or non-degenerated or non-pathologic situation was previously, and then what is happening right now as a compensation to that imbalance that has been uh, generated by pathology. And then you can generate uh, a strategy to counteract those effects uh, in a surgical or non-surgical manner. Okay, thank you very much. The next question uh, was written by Dr. Madriñan from Colombia, and it, it is as follows. Dr. Torres, thank you for the lecture. How would you apply the concept of instantaneous axis of rotation for planning treatment in an imbalanced spine? Thank you. The axis of rotation is actually quite important when you have to uh, plan surgery either for a kyphosing event or a high lower dorsing event. So in the most common case where you have a lack of lower doses, you have a, a flat back or you have a kyphotic deformity, that axis of rotation is where you're going to be acting on to generate an extension movement arm. That'd be the uh, actually the central point of an osteotomy, for example, or if you're going to do any kind of posterior shortening, the center of that shortening is going to be the uh, axis of rotation. And if you're just doing compression, for example, to, to generate some kind of extension, you're going to have to think on how on each spinal segment, where that axis of rotation is going to be and how flexible that disc is going to be. Because those things or those two things are going to limit how much extension is gonna be possible by applying just net compression forces on the posterior elements of the spine. So if you look at that in the, in the system where you're using uh, your pedicle screws, for example, or hooks to generate a compression force on the back, then you're gonna have the axis of rotation at the posterior part of the spine and your compression force is gonna be applied through your instrumentation on the back and you're gonna have an interior resist resistance force which is gonna be the disc so depending on that disc flexibility you, and the amount of force that you apply, you're going to be able to generate movement. So if that is, is altered, let's say, for example, um, because of a listhesis, then, for example, in that case, you're not going to be able to generate such an extension moment as if you could in, in a patient with a, a, a disc that is not ruptured or, or on a slip, for example. Okay, wonderful. So next question from Dr. Daza says, which are the major mechanisms that will summarize degenerative disc disease? Thank you, doctor. Well, that's, that's something that we're constantly learning about. Um, not, it's not only the forces, there's obviously biological components that have to do with uh, genetics, that have to do with how each personal body responds to those loads. Um, one of the things about sagittal balance is trying to understand what's happening biomechanically to therefore lessen the load on the spine and try to have a more harmonious transfer of energy through the spinal column. This will make the spinal column more efficient and therefore we can prevent problems associated with surgery where we alter this balance. And uh, this is usually the most common cause of problems after surgery, when we don't take into account what are the consequences of our alterations or surgical alterations to this biomechanical balance, which can be viewed through alignment. And we don't take this into account, we're gonna have more problems with PJK, more problems with hardware failure, and more problems with chronic disability and pain after surgery. Perfect. Next question goes, from Luis Javier Lopez and said, what is the pelvic parameter that is mainly corrected in a lumbar spine instrumentation? Well, that depends on, usually you try to act on lumbar lordosis, but that's gonna depend on each specific case. Uh, 
Sometimes you need to correct low doses. Sometimes you're going to correct, uh, need to correct the tilt. Sometimes you actually have to do a larger uh, workload where you're not only those components that need to be changed, but also you have to generate a shift in the C7 plumb line, which is the gravity line, general gravity line of the body. So that's going to depend actually on how your analysis goes and what the, situ the specific situation of the patient is. Perfect. Next question from Dr. Rodriguez. It is, how can you predict which is the first spinal element to be damaged due to spinal imbalance? Well, that depends on the, uh, at the, on where or where the contact force is acting. Usually what tends to, in de degenerative spinal disease, what tends to be damaged first is the disc because it's the weakest element. Then usually it comes to the posterior elements, the facet joints, which are going to be low overloaded as soon as the disc starts de degenerating as it becomes damaged. So usually it's in that order when it comes to degenerative spinal disease. But to that, you also have to add the, the, the effects of uh, inflammatory disease and uh, sometimes and usually uh, a muscular disease, that be it because uh, the patient actually has a muscular problem or usually because there's a lack of tone and muscular force because of lack of exercise or uh, the effects of, uh, for example, an overweight patient, for example. So there, there are a lot of elements, but usually the disc tends to be one of the big protagonists uh, at the early stages of spinal disease, I would say. Okay, perfect. So this next question uh, is very interesting in order to continue with your major idea. And is the disc height loss or degeneration the major mechanism for loss of sagittal balance? There are different components to that. Um, I would say the loss of alignment would be one of the big mechanisms. It generates a vicious cycle where once you start losing alignment, usually in a kyphosing uh, event or loss of lumbar rhodosis, which is usually associated to alterations in disc height, then you're going to start moving the C7 plumb line forward. And that's going to tend to shift the instantaneous axis of, of rotation on the different segments of the spine backward. Therefore, you're going to have a larger distance forward, enhancing the flexion forces on the spine. And once this starts to happen, it's going to have a kind of a snowball effect because the muscle usually counteracts this. But as aging becomes, you become older and older and older, your muscle becomes weaker, weaker, weaker. And your disc uh, at, at the same time is gonna be more degenerated. So these things will tend to imbalance the spine towards more kyphosis. Not only does the actual kyphoding, kyphoding force tend to empower or reinforce itself because it tends to move the spine forward, therefore, giving a more moment to those forces. But at the same time, aid, the effects of aging lowers the capability of the normal muscle and ligaments to counteract these forces. So this is why we tend to see that with degenerative changes, the spine tends to go in a kyphosing position. Perfect. Dr. Khaled Ashur says, can we explain the C5 radiculopathy that might occur after cervical laminectomy based on spine biodynamics? Thank you. That's actually a very interesting question. Um, C5 is in a special position with respect to compressive forces. It is one of the segments that tends to ca carry more load on the cervical spine, and it's close to the transition point of the spine. So in some way, you could probably think so um, because the, the forces applied in that spinal segments are tend to be larger, but at the same time, the C5 nerve root is quite big. So that would make it a, a, a specific place where pathology tends to be more probable because of the loads that are shared upon that segment. It tends toward the back of the, uh, the or the end of the cervical lower doses. And it's, it's a transitional segment as well, where not only is it carrying more load, but at the same time, it is in a transition point where the movement is high above it, but low below it. So it, it would tend to be a place where uh, biomechanical charges uh, or loads be, are much higher. Wonderful. Dr. Perez is asking, Dr. Torres, mm -hmm. thank you for such a great lecture. In a chronic inflammatory disease with progressive imbalance, 
what could you treat first? Well, uh, if you have a patient with a specific disease, um, like um, let's say uh, an, um, spondylosing, ankylosing spondylitis, for example, or any other kind of uh, inflammatory disease, you do. Uh, it is a very good idea to start to treat those problems first, and uh, so that you can once you you actually you should tend to go to surgery uh, one time or another. Uh, you have less problems with relation to the uh, consequences of the inflammatory disease, like in rheumatoid arthritis. And many of these conditions also are associated with varying degrees of osteoporosis, which at the same time, by uh, weakening the bone, well, they generate a, a, its own series of problems with respect to the bone implant interface and the amount of forces that can be applied. So yes, it is very important in patients with uh, different kinds of inflammatory diseases to treat this and uh, start at the same time, you can start working on trying to better the musculature, doing physical therapy, better the posture. And then once these things are uh, somewhat under control, you can start planning a surgical strategy. Thank you very much. Dr. Laos says, Good morning. What is the most advisable thing to do to assess whether an alter alteration in the balance may be due to compensatory mechanism for pain? Thanks. That, that's actually a very, very good question. It's, it's still difficult to say with like a black and white precision, but uh, you do have various ways to infer this. And uh, we'll see some of that in, uh, in the next lectures. But once you can evaluate the current state of balance, you can try to evaluate if that current state is actually a balanced, a compensated balanced state and try to infer which balance mechanisms are actually acting at that spine or if it's completely unbalanced. Once you know what of these situation or when, what situation you are, you're gonna think, well, it's compensated balance. Let's see what kind of mechanisms the patient is using to compensate that imbalance. And then you can try to do or plan strategies to act upon those compensatory mechanisms or sometimes on the inherent problem which led the patient to use the compensatory mechanisms. So it is an important part of the, of the planning or the evaluation of sagittal balance. Sagittal balance is a great tool to under, try to understand what's happening and then try to generate a surgical uh, plan forward. Perfect. Dr. Madrinian asks, if the trabecular bone works as a strain distributor on axial forces, would interbody fusion affect the distribution of forces upon the spine? It does. Um, that is especially important in the cases of osteoporosis. When you fuse a spinal segment, then you're, gonna, you're generating stress on the segment above and the segment below. And this is the main reason that we have problems in, in, in adjacent uh, segment disease, because the relationship between the, those two spinal segments, which are now more separated than before, is going to depend on the angular position that they are and the position in space that they are. So this is where we act on creating kyphosis or a neutral position or, or lower doses in that segment. And the more segments we operate on, then the overall change in shape is going to be more evident. And that's going to change the mechanics of the spine in different manners. So it is very important uh, how, how, that, how that happens. With respect to the trabecular bone, well, there's gonna be a, that's, it, the, it's gonna be a part of the load uh, sharing uh, properties of the bone. So if you're using especially uh, inter, interbody implants, then it's gonna have a big impact on the possibility of having uh, uh, um, an implant going into the vertebral body. So that's, that's one of the problems that you have to evaluate. Dr. Vergara is asking, how is the SVA, the sagittal vertical axis, related to these concepts? Uh, as, as we talked a little bit previously, that C7 plumb line, or, which is, also, is related to the SVA, it's going to generate, if it's in the proper uh, relationship, close to the posterior corner of the sacrum, that's, that's going to make uh, an, an adequate alignment of the gravitational force of the spine. 
that will tend the spine to be in a position where it's easily balanced. So you don't have to apply much forces to move the, the create a flexion or an extension moment. Therefore, in that state, the posterior musculature doesn't have to do much work to maintain an upright posture. If you move that backward, then you're going to have to use all the muscles to create a flexion movement. If you do move that forward, the opposite is true. And this is relationship is also important, not only on, with respect to the sacrum, but because of its, its relationship to the hip joint. Because at the end, you're going to translate the, the forces from the head to the spine, to the sacrum, to the pelvis, to the hip joint, and then to the feet. So it's not only the relationship of, of this gravity line on the spine, but this how this relates to the hip joint and to the to the, the rest of the lower limbs. So this is something that's is is you have to have to evaluate. We're centering ourselves on the spine, but we have to remember that we do not walk on the spine. We walk on our feet. So we assume that the hips and the feet are right and are 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 all right when you're just analyzing the spine. But when you do an, a physical examination, you do have to include what's happening with the knee joints, with the ankle joints, and with the hip joints. Thank you, Dr. Torres. So I'm afraid we have finished our Q&A session. So we thank all our participants and observers for being with us today. Remember, we are on our pre-congress course about basics of the sagittal balance of the spine. Our first lecture has come to an end, and in a few minutes, we will be starting our second lecture.